Hello my friends, we're back. So it's been a while, but let's get started. We're on uh, challenge 11. Now challenge 11 is called Elevator. And this is a simplistic game to show the importance of interfaces and comp composability within uh, Ethereum and, and Web3 generally. And also how that can increasingly, increasingly become more complex, which is leading to more um, exploitations and security flaws at the interaction point between contracts or uh, different chains even. With that being said, uh, the elevator game is simple. So the challenge here is basically stating that the elevator won't let you reach the top of the building, right? And our job is to get to the top of this, this so-called toy building. Now, I have a series of notes here, as per usual, and I had to cheat on this one, sadly, but it's all right, because I learned a lot. And when cheating through this one, we learned a lot about how interfaces interact between contracts and the importance of considering how they interact. Now, I think what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to walk through my notes, then we'll walk through the code, and then we'll exploit the challenge. So first things first, as I said, I had to cheat, so thankfully, uh, Mr. Web3 Dev dude uh, basically provided a pretty good explanation. So if you don't like mine, go watch his, and he'll explain kind of what's happening there and, and why why this is exploitable and all that fun stuff. Uh, some other stuff is the point I wanted to point out at the very beginning of this challenge is a higher level concept that really underlies or sits above what we're talking about here. And the overarching concept is composability. Now, this isn't anything new. So this is something that's been discussed previously before Web3, but there's a very, very important ethos around composability for the future of you know, blockchain or Web3, whatever you want to call it. And the first time I was introduced to this concept of composability within the, within the realm of Web3 was actually a really interesting talk that I'd recommend watching if you're interested in this kind of stuff uh, by, I think it's Multicoin Capital where they basically talk through how they're putting a big bet in the next, I'd say, probably three to five years on this whole ethos of composability and how um, DeFi is built on top of that, which will just kind of be a multiplying effect where we can connect different financial Legos, which I've seen another analogy of connecting different uh, blockchains and contracts and stuff together to have more interesting use cases and also more complex use cases. But with composability and interaction and complexity comes uh, basically easy exploitation or um, very impactful exploitation. Another thing here to point out is there's a few fundamental ingredients. This isn't all of them, but these are some of the things that came to mind for me for a um, robust and sustainable composable ecosystem that where things can interact. And some of those are standards. So uh, common standards that we're all aware of are ERC-20, ERC-721. And both of these standards have uh, a series of interfaces of functions that you can interact with without actually having to look at the thousands of lines of code or how many of our lines of code that go with these different uh, standards. Uh, another one is libraries. So having libraries that you can port in information such as um, safe math from Open Zeppelin and other things where you can kind of utilize their code in a, in a safe and safe fashion. That's composability. The one that we're going to discuss here is interfaces and interfaces from my understanding, can be interacted in two fashions. So you can interface with a contract if you know what the function is called via your source code as you're typing out your contract, or um, you can utilize it via the ABI as well, which is basically pulling the first four bytes of that function um, when it's kind of hashed and, and all that stuff. So those are some ingredients for composability that make up you know this holy grail of what we're looking for here in Web3. Um, some other pieces of information I wanted to share are describing interfaces more generally. So what is an interface? Now, like I said, interface and composability are nothing new. So you can look at this Wikipedia page that I'll kind of link below. And it really walks you through kind of the general concept of what interfaces are. And there's different types of interfaces. So there's hardware, software, um, human interfaces, and things like that. What we care about right now is the object-oriented languages, because that's what kind of what Solidity is. And they're going to talk through kind of what the purpose of interfaces and how they function in that little snippet of language or English there. Now, a uh, good explanation in the context of Solidity is actually the docs. So if you just go to the documentation, which I'll link below, they kind of walk you through some of the um, restrictions on, on interfaces, and they also talk through uh, the purpose of interfaces. And you can kind of get an idea of looking at the snippets of code and the explanation. 
That's another good explanation of interfaces. Now, my simplistic definition of interfaces will be much simpler than everybody else's probably, where you have, say you have a contract A, and we have contract B. Do a little slice there. Now contract A, say they have four functions. Inside of this, they wanna basically have two functions be interfaced by other contracts. Well, contract B can call these two functions so say contract, uh, inter con, you know, interface one, interface two, and it's gonna be able to utilize or interact with the code execution of contract A here by interfacing with these two external functions that have been established by contract A. And it's giving us the ability to build on top of contract A, utilizing some of the code they've already written to incorporate that logic and that uh, execution into our contract so we can have Lego box, which, was, which is kind of why I put this image here, right? is we have um, all these interfaces in between all these contracts and we can actually start snapping them together like Lego so we can have more of a complex and robust use case. So we'll see what that looks like in code in a second, but that's a kind of like a very intuitive, quick understanding of what the interfaces are and how that sits within the scenario of Web3. Now something else I'll call out here that I saw within the docs and um, this is something I knew previously but I wanted to call out here just for you to kind of get an idea, is within the layout of a contract, and uh, the items within a contract, there's a specific order that's recommended as a best practice when programming in Solidity. And interfaces are preferred to sit right here. So it's after the pragma statement and the import statements, and then before the libraries and contracts. And that's where interfaces should sit within the um, layout of a contract itself. Inside of a contract, you have this situation here where these different um, you know, statements and things should be ordered in this fashion. Another thing I wanted to point out here is when looking at the exploit, there's a few situations that this exercise wants you to consider. One of those is gonna be the function modifier that's labeled on that interface. We'll play with external and we'll see why that is an issue from time to time. And we'll also see why view is maybe an alternative we'd wanna use depending on what we're trying to do with that interface. And I'll explain all that within the code when we review that. This is the consideration that I mentioned, so we'll come back to this after we've re reviewed the code and the challenge. And then uh, resources. So another resources I want to refer to is Smart Contract Programmer Person. So they always have really good content. And this one's basically talking through interfaces. So this is uh, for point six, but they also have one for point eight as well, but this one's a little lengthier and has more meat to it, so I recommended this. Additionally, there is a code snippet that is available as well that kind of mimics that video. So you can kind of look at this code snippet here and walk through this as they're walking through the video if you like. And that are, that's the resource. With that being stated, let's go to the code. All right, so this is our code. So I've, just so you're aware, I'm sure you are by now if you've watched all these videos, is I've copied and pasted this source code out of here into VS Code because I can make it bigger and I prefer it here. All right, with this code, we're gonna start per usual. So we have our pragma statement, so this is what it's compiling to. Remember, they're gonna to have to put this to eight if you wanted to compile it as of today. We have our interface. So this is what we've discussed historically. And when you create an interface within a contract or above a contract, you have to state the term of interface. This is new as of point eight, I think. And our interface is gonna be referring to the building contract. And the building contract has a function inside of it that they would actually like to make external, which is a function that uh, basically returns a true or false statement of if you're on the last floor. So it takes a UN and you could put in say, I'm in, I'm on floor three and it'll return a statement saying, you know, you are on the last floor if it's true. If it's not the last floor, it'll return a false, which is the, the Boolean statement here. Now the external piece here, external, this modifier for this function actually allows the modification of state. So you can actually change information um, within this function as it returns. Now, an alternative would be to utilize view and view basically allows you to read state, um, but you're not allowed to modify it. And this sometimes can save certain situations uh, and prevent malicious actor from modifying the state of your contract if you didn't necessarily want them to if they do it in a malicious fashion. Now that's our interface. Now we have our contract here, so this is gonna be our target and this is the elevator game. 
In the elevator game, we have a few state variables here. So we have top, which is Boolean. So that's basically referring to basically saying, uh, are you at the top or not? And then we have UN, so the floor that we want to go to. Below that, we have our function. And our function is called go to. It's taking in a UNT for floor. So this is basically the floor that we want to go to, and it's public. Below that, we're initiating our contract, so our building contract here. So we're going to initiate our building contract, and the sender, whoever sends to this contract, is going to initiate it with the data that they provided. That's going to then be popped into this variable called building. And then we have our conditional. Now, this is where the magic happens. This conditional is basically stating that if the floor provided in the last floor is false, then continue. That's a really important thing to remember because that's going to come into play when we actually look at our attack contract. Now, after we've considered this is false, and we know that it's saying false because it has this, uh, this bang at the beginning, and that's basically negating or saying the opposite of what is true. So we're basically saying that you know, if this is false, continue. If so, then take the number provided and put it into the variable floor, and then take that variable and put it inside of this function here, and then call it within um, the is last floor. So it's going to say, you know, is the number I put in here inside of this function, is this the last floor as top? And it's going to set it as top here. So if we actually can set the top here, then it'll automatically become true. So our goal here is basically to get access to this function and meet this condition as false. If we can meet that condition, then we can continue forward, set top, and then we win the game or win the elevator challenge. Now that's the, um, that's the setup here, right? And if we go to our interface here, we can look at it quickly. So if we do as we've done previously, we'll do contract ABI, you'll see all the information listed out here. So we have the floor that we mentioned, we have the go to and the top. Now let's take a peek at the attack that we're going to run. Now with our attack, as per usual, we have our pragma statement and actually, you know, Let's add this here, because if you, oh no. Let's add this up here, because if not, then we'll get uh, compiler issues. All right, so we have our solidity statement as 0.8, and then we're gonna import the eth.11 soul, so we can actually interact with some of the functions we wanna interact with there. In our contract called elevator attack, we have a few statements here. So our state variable is automatically set to true. We're gonna name that as toggle. So that's gonna allow us to toggle the uh, top floor. We have our elevator. Uh, we're initiating our elevator contract here and we're gonna set it to this target. So that's our target address that we're gonna we're gonna attack for that contract. And then in the constructor, as per usual, most of the previous challenges we've done this, where we're setting up our constructor and initially we're gonna put in the target address, which is gonna be our eth.11. That's the target address for targeting. We're going to instantiate that with the contract of elevator. We're going to put it into this variable target. Next, we have two ver uh, functions. So we have is last floor and setup. So is last floor is going to basically do what we've already discussed. So we're going to provide a number. It's going to return basically if that's the last floor or not. So if we, when we put in a number here, it's important to point out that the toggle we've set up historically up here as true, we're automatically going to change that to false. And, the, and then we're going to return as false. The reason that we're doing this is remember how I discussed in the previous uh, contract that this condition here, it has to be false for us to continue because we have this conditional here saying that if the floor provided is false, then continue. So we're going to basically meet that requirement without even acknowledging the number inside of this function, right? So it's saying it's taking a UNT, but really it doesn't matter. Um, and then we're going to change it to false so we can pass that condition and it's going to return false to that contract so we can continue through that if statement. After that, we're going to go to set top and our set top is going to take in a number that we're going to provide. So this can be whatever number we want. So we can say five. And when we put in this number five, it's then going to call the go to on the target and it's going to run through and execute that function. So remember in go to, once we've um, met the condition of false, then we can actually set the top with the five that we've, we've pushed in. And when we just push in that five, it's going to then set the top, so then I'll, that'll be true instead of false, and that's going to help us win the game. And that's kind of the overall process of the code and how it works. So with that being stated, let's go to Remix and look at our code here. So this is the code I just walked you through, so we don't have to walk through it again. I'm going to save it and make sure it compiles. should. So then we're going to go here, and we're going to get our target. <laughs> Not Andrew. Who's that? All right. So this is our target address, and that's who we want to attack. 
and we want to make sure that we've selected the right stuff. So first you have to have inject web three as per usual. Then you want to go to your contract for the attack. So we're going to do um, EL attack and we are going to paste in our target. I've changed the name slightly here. So you'd obviously have to do the same. So this is EL and EL attack just because I don't want to, I'm so lazy. I don't want to type out elevator, I guess. So we've deployed this and it said that it's checked off. So we're good here. And before we do anything else, I want to show you that if we go to contract top, oh no, <laughs> can't type. Okay, so you can see it's false. We wanna change that to true, so we're on the top floor. Additionally, if we look at floor and we check this information here, we'll see that here we're at currently at floor zero because we've not put anything in. So if we go here and we have our information here so we can see that that's our target, and we can see our toggle is currently set to true. So if we set the top to five, then it's gonna run through the information I've just explained. So it's gonna change the floor to false. So we can pass the condition of if. It's then gonna inject the five as top. And then once it's ejected the five as top, it's gonna to change that condition back to true. So then we can actually continue through and meet the challenge. So if we come here and everything has worked as expected, you can see top is set to true, floor here is set to five, and we've, uh, we've beat the challenge. So if we submit our instance now, it will hopefully let us go through. Now as this is loading, I'll go back to the point here that I wanted to call out. Now there's a link here that you'll find after the end of the challenge that basically brings you back to this section here, walking you through specifically um, what the view function does and why you might want to consider that for an interface. So as I mentioned previously, there's a few different options. So we have set up as external for the contract we're targeting above. And what that means is we can change state and we can read. So we can write and read. With view, you can only read, you can't write. And when setting up an interface, like I said previously, setting it up as view mitigates the amount of information or actions that one can take when they're interacting with the interface. And the reason that's a big deal here is because if we can modify the state, we can modify that top and toggle it to true with the, the input that we provided for the top, then we're going to actually be able to adjust it and set that um, set the elevator to what we want it to and, and win. So here you can see, level completed, all is geared and groovy, and this is the link that I shared with you for the view statement. And in this explanation, you can see it basically states that um, you can use the view function modifier on the interface in order to prevent state modification, which we've already talked about. Pure is the same concept, but you can't even read with pure. So pure is something more of an internal uh, contract that you, that you utilize. That being said, this was level 11, and next we're going to level 12, which is privacy.